Okay, I'd like to take um, this opportunity to offer a few largely, I think, speculative thoughts about some of the relationships that might be struck between McCarthy's Blood Meridian and what we might call the conservative sensibilities of the American right. This isn't necessarily a completely original reading of the novel, um, but neither, I think, is it a, a particularly conventional reading. So I'd like to start um, just with a few comments really on the on the parameters within which I think readers might approach and make sense of um, uh, such a rich and dense piece of writing as, as Blood Meridian. One of the guiding critical orthodoxies of our time is that it is readers, not authors, who determine the meanings of literature. And this assertion, of course, transfers the responsibility for identifying the most important or most meaningful dimensions of any piece of literature to those who actually do the reading. In the process of making meaning, readers may fix on certain aspects of a literary text while ignoring or downplaying the significance of other aspects. The closest critical analogy I can think of here actually comes from, from film studies rather than um, from literary criticism. I'm thinking here of um, Richard Maltby's still hugely influential book on, um, on Hollywood cinema, where Maltby describes the conventional Hollywood blockbuster as an aesthetic form that is loaded with multiple different attractions, as uh, Maltby uh, calls them, which audiences can um, choose to focus upon or choose to ignore depending on what kind of experience they wish to have from a film. An example that, that Maltby uses is James Cameron's Titanic from 1997, um, a film he describes as remarkable for, and I'm quoting him here, the sheer diversity of its various elements which allowed its different audiences to turn it into the experience they wished to have. Titanic was, at the same time, a teenage love story, a heritage movie, a special effects spectacular, a costume drama, a chick flick, a disaster movie, a cross-class romance, an intimate historical epic, and the most expensive movie ever made. Different audiences, still quoting Maltby here, could view Titanic as a celebration of selflessness and self-sacrifice, a subversive commentary on class relations, a sumptuously nostalgic display of bygone opulence, a denunciation of capitalist greed, a brilliant exercise in state-of-the-art special effects, a demonstration of the transcendent triumph of love over death, a feminist action adventure movie, or an extended opportunity to gaze at Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> uh, the critic critical analogy I'd like to draw between um, a film like Titanic and a novel like Blood Meridian um, can only be pushed so far. Maltby is talking here about hyper-commodified forms of, of popular culture with mass audiences and a global reach. We're talking about overtly literary, uh, literary fiction with a much smaller uh, readership that may certainly overlap with the audience for, uh, for Titanic. Um, but an audience also, I think, that will be quite different in, in a number of ways. So we can only push this analogy um, so far, but I think the basic principle of Maltby's argument works quite well um, as a prism through which to critique prose as rich and multidimensional as McCarthy's. Blood Meridian, in particular, is, is so packed with different simultaneous hooks or attractions that it can be difficult to know where to start. Do we focus on McCarthy's dazzling landscapes? Do we concentrate on the violence? Are we impacted most um, by those passages of soaring Old Testament Gothicism? Um, we might want to concentrate on the novel's complex debates about representation or on its existential or theological dimensions on the way McCarthy plays with and subverts genre or on the book's intertextuality and and so on. And I think with a book like Blood Meridian, we could probably extend that list pretty much as we, um, as far as we uh, um, 
as we want to. Blood Meridian may not be James Cameron's Titanic, but the basic critical principle then, I think, remains the same. If we accept that readers or viewers make meaning, we also need to accept that different readers are likely to derive very different meanings from a novel as rich and enigmatic as Blood Meridian. Partly because, as Maltby tells us in that Hollywood film, um, different readers of Blood Meridian are likely to fix upon and emphasise and perhaps identify with um, very different things within the text. Readers also make meaning, of course, within particular historical and political circumstances. Or we might say um, the extent to which readers are free to determine the meanings of Blood Meridian that freedom is hedged and circumscribed by the positions that readers occupy in the networks of power and contingency that shape their own moment in history. Readers, just like writers, and just like novels, are historically produced. And the freedom that readers enjoy to make meaning out of novels is unavoidably, I think, enmeshed or in tension with the values, the ideologies, the lived experience of, um, uh, of re the place in history that, that readers um, take up. A Blood Meridian is first published and read during the middle to late 1980s, during the years of the second Reagan administration, um, a period of powerful conservative political hegemony in the US, a period when we see um, the rise to power of the new Christian right, a sustained assault on the powers of trade unions and the remnants of the New Deal welfare state. We see a ramping up of Cold War conflict, sometimes to genuinely apocalyptic levels, and a series of entrenched and far-reaching backlash movements against the progressive politics of the 1960s. Some critics have read Blood Meridian as a displacement and an objectifying of Reaganism into the desert landscapes of northern Mexico and uh, the southwestern US. Critics such as these tend to see the novel as an adversarial intervention in 1980s political contexts. Um, the novel is frequently read as prose that can and should be read as being very much at odds with the aggressive conservatism of the time in which the book is first published. The novel has been described, for example, um, uh, in adversarial terms as a radical revisioning of American westward expansion and imperialist doctrines of American nationhood. It's been seen as an anti-enlightenment treatise, as an exercise in linguistic environmentalism, and as a self-reflexive meta-narrative whose first principles include assumptions about the limitations of language and the inherently provisional nature of representation more generally. All of these readings look completely plausible to me, um, and they've all been elaborated at length, not just by individual critics, but by what I think we could probably now call particular schools of thought within um, McCarthy criticism. But I do wonder at times if this catalogue of very liberal approaches to Blood Meridian actually tells us more about the proclivities of academics, literary critics, um, as it does about the writing of Cormac McCarthy. Over the years in the US particularly, I've certainly met readers of Blood Meridian and huge fans of McCarthy generally um, who quite happily identify themselves as conservative Republicans. And you don't have to spend very long um, searching through literary discussion forums on the net um, to find voices talking about McCarthy's fiction in one thread uh, while offering distinctly right-wing perspectives on, uh, on, on a range of topics in, uh, in other threads. Very few of these voices, if any at all, talk directly and openly about how they engage um, McCarthy politically. Um, though I think this is partly do, due to, um, uh, it's partly because conservatism in the round, and, and certainly conservatism in the US, um, 
uh, uh, tends to, to define and construe the political in, in, in probably far narrower terms than, than, than we might, uh, I dare say, as, um, as people working with literature and, um, uh, uh, and culture. So what I'm doing here is um, openly and admittedly quite speculative, but I'm certainly intrigued that a novel like Blood Meridian, which has been embraced so comprehensively by liberals as a subversive revisionist text, I really am intrigued that this novel also appears to speak politically, um, presumably in very different ways, um, to readers whose own conservatism means that they bring very different values and very different politics to the novel. I think it's probably fair uh, to presume um, that conservative readers who value Blood Meridian um, do not do so because they feel that their underlying values or overarching world views have been challenged or shattered in some way, in any way, um, in this book. So the first question I'd like to float today is, what might overtly conservative readers have made of Blood Meridian um, at the time of its publication in the mid to late 1980s? What is it about the novel that um, accommodates the reading sensibilities of contemporary conservatism? Bearing in mind that many readers of this novel, perhaps by now the majority of readers of this novel, um, will have come to the text having first discovered the McCarthy of The Road or No Country for Old Men. Um, a second question I'd like to, to ask is what might conservative readers of the post 9-11 period uh, have found in this novel that might affirm or at least chime um, with their values, their politics, their world view in another period of American history the early years of the War on Terror, aggressively shaped again by conservative, specifically neoconservative um, hegemony um, in the US. I should stress here that I'm not necessarily interested in what we might describe as a reader's conscious or willful ideological engagement with Blood Meridian. Literary and cultural theory tells us in a variety of ways that politics and ideology often operate in veiled, opaque and subliminal ways. In fact, part of the power of ideology that works, we might say, is that it is difficult to see it working. Ideology that does its job, ideology that bonds people together into communities or groups, ideology that reconciles us effectively to the world that we live in, ideology such as this tends to work upon us or through us perhaps, invisibly, unconsciously, so that the values that we hold appear simply normal, natural or right. So I'm not talking here necessarily about what um, conservative readers might consciously make of Blood Meridian after a sustained period of critical repose and reflection. What I'm really interested in are the ways that McCarthy's writing might, for some readers, appear to affirm what I'm going to call um, the um, structures of feeling characteristic of the right-wing hegemony of the 1980s, or the structures of feeling characteristic of the later period of um, conservative hegemony, hegemony during the post 9-11 Bush era. This phrase, structure, structures, of feeling comes from Raymond Williams who, who first coined the term back in the 1950s um, in an attempt to develop and elaborate older, um, more rigid, more clumsy perhaps understandings of ideology codified in the Marxist tradition. In Williams, a structure of feeling refers to a set of values, a set of beliefs and perceptions that are widely shared, but with varying degrees of commitment or self-awareness. For the most part, this phrase, um, certainly in the way that, that Raymond Williams uses it, 
Um, this phrase implies values that are felt rather than values that are known. Values that are sensed or intuited um, as part of daily lived experience rather than values that are coherently or systematically uh, articulated or even necessarily acknowledged. And what I'm really interested in here is the reception of McCarthy's work, or at least the range of possible receptions by readers. The ideological uses, conscious or otherwise, to which contemporary readers might put McCarthy's prose in a specific historical time and place. When I suggest that Blood Meridian might be read as an affirmation of conservative structures of feeling that prevail in the US after 9-11, for example, I don't mean that readers might use this book to support directly or willfully the invasion of Iraq or the rendition and torture of terrorist suspects. Um, what I mean is that contemporary American readers in context, after 9-11, for example, at the height of a domestic neoconservative insurgency in an era of foreign wars and unrestrained military violence, might sense in Blood Meridian at the inarticulate level of feeling a range of affirmations of their own um, neoconservatism. So let me broach, first of all, the second of the two questions um, uh, I posed a moment ago. What might conservative sensibilities who first encounter McCarthy um, in the road or in No Country for Old Men make of Blood Meridian if their expectations of Blood Meridian are conditioned by their prior experience of these later War on Terror novels? What might be the hooks or attractions, to use Richard Maltby's term, that conservative readers might fix upon at the inarticulate level of feeling uh, or effect. One way of beginning to answer this question, um, certainly in respect of the road, um, would be to consider briefly some of the ways in which the diegetic world of that novel um, might be said to chime harmoniously in a range of ways with the neoconservative narrative about 9-11 that comes out of the Bush White House. Just as the official narrative about 9-11 steers a pragmatic route around the material causes and contexts that prompt Islamist terrorists to knock down the World Trade Center, so too the road, I'm going to suggest, gives us a very similar story about a catastrophe whose causes and contexts are left deliberately vague and unexplained. A catastrophe in the road whose material histories and triggers seem purposefully opaque in a narrative which, therefore, um, much like the neoconservative narrative about 9-11, um, tends to block or blunt our engagement with it on an intellectual level, um, encouraging, um, first of all, I think, emotional and moral responses from readers to a narrative in the road that is radically stripped of history and causation. Just like American neoconservatism at the end of the 20th century, particularly neoconservatism after 9-11, the road also presents us with a narrative cosmos shaped by the presence of dark existential threats, a cosmos shaped by terror of the other, and the cosmos conditioned above all by the absolute necessity and primordial truth of extreme violence in defence of innocence and virtue. Undergirding the road as a whole, there is also an acceptance of entropy and decay as the unifying experience of what is left of the world, including what is left of culture and language. The very same premise uh, in fact, about entropy and decay, uh, around which the intellectual roots of American conservatism have traditionally understood and analysed modernity as a whole, a process of um, uh, irresistible uh, entropy um, and decay. Uh, 
considered then at the level of affect or at the level uh, of feeling or as ideology that is experienced by readers at a pre-conscious level that might be prior to articulation in language, the act of reading the road might certainly work, I would argue, for some readers as a powerful affirmation of post 9-11 neoconservatism in the US. If there is a discernible conservative structure of feeling to the road, readers of No Country for Old Men might find similar things perhaps, not just in the pathos and bathos of Sheriff Bell's exhausted old school Texas Republicanism, but also I think in, um, in what is a distinctive sense of moral paralysis or seizure that is built into the deep aesthetic structures of No Country for Old Men. A paralysis that stems, I think, from the exercise in intellectual relativism that underpins the central relationship between Sheriff Bell and the serial killer Anton Sugar. One of the main structural principles around which the narrative of No Country is built, it seems to me, is the paralleling of Bell and Sugar's respective codes for living. On one hand, Bell says, People anymore, you talk about right and wrong, they're liable to smile at you, but I never had a lot of doubts about things like that. On the other hand, Chigurh, very similarly, is described as a man with, quote, principles. Principles that transcend money or drugs or anything like that. Again, on one hand, um, Carla Jean asks Bell, is your word good? Bell gives, quote, my word, no harm will come to Moss from him. Similarly, on the other hand, when Chigurh tells Carla Jean he's come to kill her, he says it's because he gave, quote, his word uh, that he would. And where Chigurh claims to live what he calls a simple life, Bell says he sets out to live his life similarly in the strictest way I know how. The relationship between Bell and Chigurh's very different applications of very similar sounding values is highly problematic in No Country for Old Men. Because while Bell's narrative offers a sustained moral critique of Chigurh, Bell's point of view is itself repeatedly ironised and undermined in the text. A procedure of undermining the voice of Sheriff Bell that we see in the very first sentence of the novel where the sheriff who is presented to us as the notional antithesis of the killer Sugar talks to the reader about how he once sent a boy to the gas chamber in Huntsville. This ironising of Bell's voice helps reinforce further, I think, the parity that the novel appears to propose between the two versions of the very same values espoused by Bell and Sugar respectively. I don't mean that the novel posits a strict moral equivalence between these two characters, just that it offers us two radically different versions of the same thing, both of which claim to be truths for living, but both of which are depicted in the novel as flawed and provisional. I'm working back to Blood Meridian. Amid the bloodletting of No Country for Old Men, the real horror the novel perhaps presents us with, and a horror that is embodied in these deep structures of the text, as well as in the language that protagonists speak, is a horror at the very possibility of moral equivalence or parity suggested by these parallels in the characterization. A thoroughly conservative horror, um, I'd suggest, that those doctrines of liberal relativism which tell us, for example, that good and evil are not fixed and absolute things, but fluid things, social constructs, doctrines which tell us that rather than thinking of good and evil as fixed values, we should think of them as relational, each requiring the presence of the other in order to give definition to itself. With what we like to think of as good and evil, um, not as related positions in a kind of vertical hierarchy of value, but as positions in a broad and potentially open-ended horizontal spectrum of possible 
values. In the end, it seems to me, the multiple points of crossover in the characterization of the two main protagonists in No Country make it very difficult, um, if we take these cro crossovers on board, to differentiate absolutely between Bell and Chigurh, between the law, um, the agent of law and order, and the agents of violence uh, and chaos. In this sense, part of what No Country for Old Men does, perhaps, is to objectify for conservative readers the full moral horror and intellectual dead end of liberal relativism itself. We started talking about this passage earlier. Um, now, I wonder whether we might find a similar conservative horror um, at relativism of various kinds in this celebrated passage from Blood Meridian, um, the passage often referred to as the Comanche attack or the, the Legion of Horribles passage. Um, I've got half of it on this slide and half of it on the next one. A legion of horribles, hundreds in number, half naked or clad in costumes, attic or biblical or wardrobed, out of a fevered dream with the skins of animals and silk finery and pieces of uniform still tracked with the blood of prior owners. Coats of slain dragoons, frogged and braided cavalry jackets, one in a stovepipe hat and one with an umbrella and one in white stockings and a blood-stained wedding veil and some in headgear or crane feathers or rawhide helmets that bore the horns of bull or buffalo and one in a pigeon-tailed coat worn backwards and otherwise naked and one in the armour of a Spanish conquistador the breastplate and pauldrons deeply dented with old blows of mace or sabre done in another country by men whose very bones were dust and many with their braids spliced up with the hair of other beasts until they trailed upon the ground and their horses' ears and tails worked with bits of brightly coloured cloth and one whose horse's whole head was painted crimson red and all the horsemen's faces gaudy and grotesque with daubings like a company of mounted clowns, death hilarious, all howling in a barbarous tongue and riding down upon them like a horde from a hell more terrible yet than the brimstone land of Christian reckoning, screeching and yammering and clothed in smoke like those vapours, vaporous beings in regions beyond right knowing where the eye wanders and the lip jerks and drools. Oh my God, <laughs> said the sergeant. A masterful piece of understatement. <laughs> Now, I should say that in, in responding to this passage from Blood Meridian, I'm leaning quite heavily here on I ideas discussed um, in the past by um, my friend and colleague um, John Beck, um, who uh, has talked about this passage in the past at conferences, um, and John certainly has suggested uh, that what we might hear speaking in this passage in fairly unadorned form is a voice or a narrative sensibility that resonates in all kinds of ways with the hegemonic politics of the new right uh, in the 1980s US. What is it, John asks, that makes the legion of horribles horrible? Where exactly is the horror in this passage? I'm just going to quote now from an old um, conference paper by John Beck. The war party is clearly horrible, John suggests, because it bears the bloody trophies of past conquests upon its collective body as a form of threatening display. But it is also doubly horrible, as Beck puts it, because the party has appropriated the attire of those forms of Western institutional authority usually associated with aspects of social order, particularly military uniforms and the wedding dress. Furthermore, John says, these signs of martial and marital orderliness have become part of some bestial orgy of cross-fertilisation. Stockings and umbrellas interwoven with buffalo horns and crane feathers. Horses are adorned like humans, 
human beings wear animal skin and silk or are otherwise naked. Like the pigeon-tailed um, coat worn backwards by one Indian, Beck suggests, this is a horror of inversion and degeneration. The sergeant's laconic response, oh my God, is one of stunned disbelief. Not just an utterance of terror in the face of a dangerous foe, but an expression of disgust at the gleaming bricolage of difference driving furiously towards him. McCarthy's rendition of this gleaming bricolage of difference presents us with a moment where the text itself appears suddenly flooded in an irresistible tide of otherness and heterogeneity with the other and the heterogeneous figured here as demonic energies within the diegetic world. And it's the nature of the narrative voice that speaks to us in this passage that is perhaps the most problematic aspect of the scene. One of the really interesting things about this passage, I think, is the lack of any mechanism or device in the text itself that might ironise the narrative voice or undercut it. The lack of something, anything in the passage that might make this voice provisional or contingent. The lack of anything uh, in this passage that might work um, in overt ways to distance or alienate the reader from the voice that speaks to us. Such an element within the reading experience, if such an element exists, has to be supplied here by the reader from outside the text read straight without any device in the passage to ironise the narrative voice or help distance us from it, and read through the prism of a certain kind of conservative consciousness in the middle 1980s, one thing this passage evokes is indeed, I think, a visceral disgust for and horror at difference and heterogeneity. Disgust for the commingling and overlapping of differences seen here in the mixing together of racial, ethnic, gendered and sexual signifiers, the collapse of discrete and polarised signs and identities, multiple <coughs> miscegenations on a grand scale, figured here explicitly as horror. Extrapolating from this passage, to the novel as a whole, we can perhaps begin making out the shape of a much broader problem in Blood Meridian. Where is the critical space or distance for the reader within the text as a whole? What is there within the words actually written on the pages of this novel that ironises or subverts Judge Holden or Joel Glanton in the way that Sheriff Bell is ironised, for example, in No Country for Old Men, or the way that Billy Parham and John Grady Cole are repeatedly ironised in the Border Trilogy? or the way in which the values and judgment of the man in the road are rendered starkly provisional at times by the values and judgment of the boy. Asking a question like this obliges us, I think, to look closely at those moments in Blood Meridian where Judge Holden's claims to ownership and control over the narrative might be challenged or undercut. You know, retreading issues that we discussed around the campfire earlier here, so I'm, I'm very aware that some of what I'm about to suggest has already been itself ironised or subverted um, or undercut, but we'll give it a go. Where do we find then moments in Blood Meridian where Holden's claim to ownership and control over the narrative might be challenged or undercut? Perhaps we might look at the various voices raised momentarily against the judge. Um, perhaps those voices will give us the kind of leverage we need within the text to ironise and subvert Holden, Tobin, Toadvine, Black Jackson, the kid, all challenge Holden at one point or another, but by the end of the novel they are either dead or they've simply faded back into the text. As is the way in Blood Meridian, none of these adversarial protagonists are given the kind of characterization or interior life that they probably need 
if they're to work as viable touchstones um, for the generating of textual opposition um, to the judge. Holden outlasts them all. And indeed, it appears, at least if we believe his words, that uh, Holden will outlast everyone and anyone. Um, underlining his more or less supernatural intensity uh, and his embodiment of primordial cosmic truth, the judge himself tells us that he will never die, he will never die. Perhaps we might then look, as some critics have looked, to the novel's epilogue as a narrative space separated off from the main body of the text, as narrative space that exists, in other words, outside of the totalising rhetoric of the judge. But the epilogue, as we began discussing um, earlier, is famously abstruse, notoriously difficult to pin down, um, and the epilogue, I think, can certainly be read as an affirmation and completion of Holden's words rather than a negation of them. We might argue, if we're becoming a little bit desperate now, that Holden is undercut on a very deep, very abstract, very meta level of the text. The judge's control over others is achieved partly through storytelling, and partly through superimposing his own representation of reality over uh, reality itself. The famous example of this being the ledgers, of course, that the judge carries in which he sketches, sketches natural artefacts before destroying uh, the originals so that only his representation of them remains. By implication, um, the novel's understanding that power derives from controlling the act of representation. By implication, this understanding, I think, makes all acts of representation arbitrary and provisional, including Holden's. But this is a very abstract, very meta way of reading Blood Meridian. Does it require, perhaps, at least some kind of basic grounding in critical theory? Does it require perhaps some kind of uh, at least intuitive grasp of the basics of post-structuralism, even to begin picking this up in any kind of elaborated way? Following this thread of the novel certainly requires concentration and effort, and I think it demands a particular kind of reading strategy or reading sensibility if we're to turn this aspect of the text into a hook or an attraction that might grab our attention amongst all the other attractions on offer in Blood Meridian. If readers find nothing in the narrative voice or narrative world of Blood Meridian to ironise or undercut the judge, and if the judge is a presence or a force who appears to outlive the narrative, then we're again thrown back on the disturbing question asked by John Beck. In the absence of critical levers or critical distance within the text that might allow us to ironise or subvert Holden, what, John Beck asks, if Blood Meridian, for some readers, actually means what it says? What if the judge's words are indeed statements of profound ontological or epistemological truth for some readers? This question might be particularly pressing, I think, given the judge's pronouncements about the eternal truth of war on one hand and the extreme military violence on which the conservative hegemonies of the 1980s and the early 2000s depend for the exporting of their ideology. During the Reagan era in the 1980s, Americans saw a dramatic ramping up of Cold War rhetoric and colossal federal investment um, in new military technologies, Tomahawk cruise missiles, B-2 stealth bombers, uh, Nighthawk stealth fighters, Humvee trucks are just some of the icons of contemporary American military violence that owe their existence to the billions poured into military research and development uh, and into federal pro procurements during the 1980s. Under Reagan, the US invaded the tiny Caribbean island of Grenada, bombed Libya, uh, 
made common cause with Saddam Hussein and provided extensive support training and supplies to the right-wing death squads charged with wiping out uh, progressive democratic reform movements in Nicaragua and El Salvador. The most notorious of these death squads, the Atla Catal Battalion in El Salvador, was formed in March 1981 under the supervision of 15 specialists in counterinsurgency from the US Army School of Special Forces. And the record of American-sponsored counterinsurgency activities in El Salvador in the 80s sounds at times like pages ripped straight from the middle of Blood Meridian. One US trainer described the Atla Catal Battalion as, quote, particularly ferocious. We've always had a hard time getting them to take prisoners instead of ears. The results of US training of Salvadoran forces were graphically described at the time in the Jesuit journal um, uh, 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 America by the Catholic priest Daniel Santiago, who tells of a peasant woman who returned home one day to find her three children, her mother and her sister, sitting around a table, each with its own decapitated head placed carefully on the table in front of the body the hands arranged on top as if each body was stroking its own head. The assassins from the Salvadoran National Guard had found it hard to keep the head of an 18-month-old baby in place, so they nailed the hands onto it. A large plastic bowl filled with blood was tastefully displayed in the centre of the table. According to Reverend Santiago, macabre scenes of this kind uh, were not uncommon at the time. People, he wrote, are not just killed by um, US-sponsored death squads in El Salvador, they are decapitated and then their heads are placed on pikes and used to dot the landscape. Men are not just disemboweled by the Salvadorian treasury police, their severed genitals are stuffed into their mouths. Salvadoran women are not just raped by the National Guard, their wombs are cut from their bodies and used to cover their faces. It is not enough to kill children, they are dragged over barbed wire until the flesh falls from their bones while parents are forced to watch. If these are some of the contexts in which Blood Meridian is born, and Blood Meridian might for some readers actually mean what it says, what do we make of the judge's assertions about the primordial and irreducible truth of war? It makes no difference what men think of war. The judge tells us war endures. As well, ask men what they think of stone. War was always here. Before man was, war waited for him. The ultimate trade awaiting its ultimate practitioner. That is the way it was and will be. War is the ultimate game because war is at last a forcing of the unity of existence. What might conservative supporters of um, conservative Cold War Reaganite militarism make of passages like this? Winding forward in time, how might conservative readers of the post 9-11 era um, relate to the judge in a period when neoconservative policymakers um, turned their backs openly on detente and diplomacy in favour of massive military violence in a war on terror that President Bush tells Americans will be open-ended, potentially infinite uh, in duration, and like no war the American people have ever known. In 2006, the same year that McCarthy published The Road, the medical journal The Lancet published a report estimating that around 655,000 Iraqis or one in 40 of the country's population had died as a direct consequence of the American invasion. What might readers make politically of McCarthy's treatment of war and violence in a context such as this? What should we think about a novel like Blood Meridian which turns war, violence and domination into primordial and essential truths about the human condition as early as the epigraphs that sit at the top of the text. 
What is the function of the epigraph that tells us before the narrative even begins um, that a 300,000-year-old 300, a skull found in Africa shows signs of having been scalped? What is the function of this epigraph other than to naturalise and, in a sense, legitimise the horrors that lie in wait for the reader within the pages of Blood Meridian, or perhaps the horrors that lie in wait for El Salvadorans at the hands of the Atlacatal Battalion or the Salvadoran National Guard. In a variety of ways, Blood Meridian, I think we all know, is a novel which can certainly accommodate the liberal politics which liberal or indeed left readers might bring with them to the act of reading the book. So the reading that I'm offering here is offered very deliberately as one possible reading um, amongst many other possible readings. And I think the very fact that McCarthy's prose can accommodate such a wide range of responses from readers is part of what makes him such a vital and significant literary voice. McCarthy's art is art which positively bristles with the tensions, conflicts and contradictions of his age in a manner I think that few writers of his generation can match. But I do think that the tendency among liberal and left critics to assume that McCarthy is by default one of us is a dangerous one. Across the spectrum, the post 9-11 period has often been one of intense revisionism. And one of the things that I hope this paper has tried to suggest is that Cormac McCarthy, however much we love him, should not necessarily be immune from that temper.